Chapter 4 The Gropings of Flight In order to understand what follows, it is requisite to form an exact idea of the droit moor lane, and, in particular, of the angle which one leaves on the left when one emerges from the Rupel and so into this lane. Droit moor lane was almost entirely bordered on the right, as far as the Rupeti Picpus, by houses of mean aspect, on the left by a solitary building of severe outlines, composed of numerous parts which grew gradually higher by a story or two as they approached the Rupeti Picpus side, so that this building, which was very lofty on the Rupeti Picpus side, was tolerably low on the side adjoining the Rupel and so. There, at the angle of which we have spoken, it descended to such a degree that it consisted of merely a wall. This wall did not abut directly on the street, it formed a deeply retreating niche, concealed by its two corners from two observers who might have been, one in the Rue Polenso, the other in the Rue Droit Moor. Beginning with these angles of the niche, the wall extended along the Rue Polenso as far as a house which bore the number 49, and along the Rue Droit Moor, where the fragment was much shorter, as far as the gloomy building which we have mentioned and whose gable it intersected, thus forming another retreating angle in the street. This gable was somber of aspect, only one window was visible, or, to speak more correctly, two shutters covered with a sheet of zinc and kept constantly closed. The state of the places of which we are here giving a description is rigorously exact, and will certainly awaken a very precise memory in the mind of old inhabitants of the quarter. The niche was entirely filled by a thing which resembled a colossal and wretched door, it was a vast, formless assemblage of perpendicular planks, the upper ones being broader than the lower, bound together by long transverse strips of iron. At one side there was a carriage gate of the ordinary dimensions, and which had evidently not been cut more than fifty years previously. A linden tree showed its crest above the niche, and the wall was covered with ivy on the side of the rupel and so. In the imminent peril in which Jean Valjean found himself, this sombre building had about it a solitary and uninhabited look which tempted him. He ran his eyes rapidly over it, he said to himself, that if he could contrive to get inside it, he might save himself. First he conceived an idea, then a hope. In the central portion of the front of this building, on the Rue Droit Moor side, there were at all the windows of the different stories ancient cistern pipes of lead. The various branches of the pipes which led from one central pipe to all these little basins sketched out a sort of tree on the front. These ramifications of pipes with their hundred elbows imitated those old leafless vine stalks which writhe over the fronts of old farmhouses. This odd espalier, with its branches of lead and iron, was the first thing that struck Jean Valjean. He seated Cassette with her back against a stone post, with an injunction to be silent, and ran to the spot where the conduit touched the pavement. Perhaps there was some way of climbing up by it and entering the house. But the pipe was dilapidated and past service, and hardly hung to its fastenings. Moreover, all the windows of this silent dwelling were grated with heavy iron bars, even the attic windows in the roof. And then, the moon fell full upon that façade, and the man who was watching at the corner of the street would have seen Jean Valjean in the act of climbing. And finally, what was to be done with Cassette? How? Was she to be drawn up to the top of a three-story house? He gave up all idea of climbing by means of the drain pipe, and crawled along the wall to get back into the Rupel and so. When he reached the slant of the wall where he had left Cassette, he noticed that no one could see him there. As we have just explained, he was concealed from all eyes, no matter from which direction they were approaching, besides this, he was in the shadow. Finally, there were two doors, perhaps they might be forced. The wall above which he saw the linden tree and the ivy evidently abutted on a garden where he could, at least, hide himself, although there were as yet no leaves on the trees, and spend the remainder of the night. Time was passing, he must act quickly. He felt over the carriage door, and immediately recognized the fact that it was impracticable outside and in. He approached the other door with more hope, it was frightfully decrepit, its very immensity rendered it less solid, the planks were rotten, the iron bands there were only three of them were rusted. 
it seemed as though it might be possible to pierce this worm-eaten barrier. On examining it he found that the door was not a door, it had neither hinges, crossbars, lock, nor fissure in the middle, the iron bands traversed it from side to side without any break. Through the crevices in the planks he caught a view of unhewn slabs and blocks of stone roughly cemented together, which passers-by might still have seen there ten years ago. He was forced to acknowledge with consternation that this apparent door was simply the wooden decoration of a building against which it was placed. It was easy to tear off a plank, but then, one found oneself face to face with a wall. Chapter V which